aspects okay uh, about uh, about 5g that i'm going to cover at least um, and then either this morning or this afternoon we'll start uh, So I'll uh, basically the the plan is this afternoon or maybe end of this morning. Let's see uh, to have um, to start to discuss a bit about small cells and heterogeneous networks. It will take approximately three to four slots, and then we'll have the last part of the course, which is roughly four to five days on complex systems and the work we are doing on this uh, complexity science uh, and application to 5G. Um, this afternoon at 2, we have the exam, right? So and it's 45 minutes, more or less, okay? So try to be here possibly five minutes before. So we kind of, you know, I hand out uh, the exams and, you know, we are all set by 2, okay? Good. Um, okay, so basically the work we did uh, in terms of Massive MIMO, we did other things, but one of the aspects we consider is how you can combine uh, massive MIMO and uh, novel waveforms. Mm? So the, the first uh, work on massive MIMO I'm aware of that it considers multi-carrier system has been done in um, the context of OFDM because mm? um, it's a natural extension of, uh, of uh, current systems. Um, there, in there start to be some works on GFDM and MIMO. I'm not aware of massive MIMO done with GFDM. Might be something. Uh, filter bank. It's difficult to do MIMO, but it turns out uh, f we will see from our results that it, it is actually possible to combine massive MIMO and filter bank. This is a bit surprising because the one of the problems filter bank traditionally has is that it doesn't get along well with MIMO. So filter bank, in essence, uh, it is a multi-carrier system. Um, it doesn't use cyclic prefix, okay, compared to other uh, techniques. It uh, allows um, subcarriers. Basically, you see this like the, the pulse-shaping filters in frequency. Um, it allows basically overlap between subcarriers. So you do have a situation where you move away from um, orthogonality in a sense, but then you recover it, we will see, by adopting some mod some specific uh, digital modulation technique. Mm? So yeah, in it, it relaxes orthogonality uh, assumptions, so synchronization assumptions in frequency, which is good, we discussed before in this course, to basically uh, um, allow for dense deployments, this machine type communications, right, where there is a crowd of devices communicating, uh, basically, um, so it, 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 it fits with some of the scenarios we are envisioning for 5G, okay, so filter bank is one of the strong candidates as a, an access scheme for 5G, might not be the winner all over, in, in you know, all over the uh, scenarios, but it will be likely applied in some, okay? So you do have different versions uh, of uh, filter bank. So what we, what we call staggered uh, multi-tone <coughs> and then cosine modulated multi-tone and then filtered multi-tone. Just checking names just to be sure, yeah. So basically, um, you see that the main difference, it's basically uh, whether you have overlap or not. So filter multi-tone uh, has appeared in the past also, um, you know, in terms, uh, I think somebody has been calling it FDM, right? Um, and basically, it's not efficient in terms of bandwidth uh, efficiency, right? Because you have to make sure that actually the different subcarriers are really not overlapping. So this is against the principle, for example, of FDM, where you have all of these overlapping um, sinks, right, in, in frequency, so you do squeeze more information in the same band. And that's something we want because we know by now the spectrum is an issue. We need spectrum, we don't have too much spectrum, especially at the low frequencies, so we have to become more efficient in terms of how we uh, use the, um, 
the bandwidth. Okay. Um, so the first two examples of filter band go in a sense uh, are sim more similar to FDM in this in in this um, respect, right? Because we do have overlapping of uh, of the um, of the pulse shapes uh, in frequency here. Okay, so um, yeah, it basically changes uh, the you know uh, like the. Um, center frequencies of these pulse shapes okay but in the main these two systems can be derived from each other okay we will pick for, for our study because I modulate multi-tone but you could do actually um, an, an analog uh, tractation with uh, staggered multi-tone okay this is the same thing basically so what we do to recover I mean to get rid of this um, uh, lack of orthogonality due to the fact that we allow subcarriers to overlap is to use what we call uh, an orthogonal um, quadrature amplitude modulation. So basically, you toggle the phase, okay? So adjacent uh, subcarriers, you see, will have a different phase. So we do toggle the phase by pi over 2. And uh, what basically this means is that we are still transmitting QOM, so a complex symbol, but we transmit the real part on say even subcarriers and the odd part on or to on um, ev uh, odd subcarriers for example okay so what does it mean um, uh, it means that there is no um, intercarrier interference this way right because on some each other subcarrier you transmit a real symbol and then you know in the remaining subcarriers you transmit an imaginary symbol right and you, you must know that if there is an angle of 90 degrees between things, it means orthogonality, right? It's like it comes from geometry, right? So uh, two things are orthogonal if they have a um, 90 degree angle, right, between them. And comp a complex number is, uh, if you represent it in the, in the R2 plane, it, it respects, right, this, um, this condition. So we just use that, and practically that's a way to get rid of interference. So you do allow, yes, uh, intercarrier interference, but it wouldn't matter because eventually you transmit real and imaginary symbols, right? So you have, uh, it's a way basically to still retain orthogonality of subcarriers, but relaxing the um, synchronization requirements. Okay, I hope I gave more or less the idea. If there is any question as usual, feel free to ask, okay? Um, yeah. Uh, now these things take time to sync okay so I don't expect everything is clear um, uh, yeah it might be a good idea if you're interested to look into our papers but even a better idea in my opinion to start uh, to, to understand an area is to read the basic texts or papers so if you are interested in any aspect I'm treating in this course contact me by email and I'll suggest you some textbooks or you know uh, fundamental papers because you see when when you read the research paper it builds upon other things so, so it's like watching a series from the last part right on and you would miss a lot of background information so I think it might not be the best idea to start from the research paper if you want to get into a certain area but rather you know to, to go into basics now one trick one trick you can adopt is um, to check um, the papers we have been citing and then trace back, right? At some point, the chain will stop. Uh, easier st uh, still to contact the authors and ask, okay, what is the book I could start to read about this? Or, you know, what is um, a good, say, tutorial paper or, you know, good course online? I mean, uh, so it, it's just, you make it very tough on you if you start right away from a research paper. I think that's not the, the best approach, okay? Going back to this, how to do research tips I'm trying to give you, okay? Um, now, what you do, basically, you have, uh, we adopt uh, um, vestigial sideband modulation, right? So you might remember from your uh, courses on modulation that this is what happens when you do vestigial sideband, right? So you retain one side of the band so you see first you basically do this 
modulation at baseband and then you you up convert right to the uh, RF frequencies so that's that's basically what you will do with, uh, with cosine modulated multitone um, and this is like the transceiver okay so as usual you have your uh, pulse shape in here you have your you go up to RF frequency and then uh, you see uh, we take basically um, the real part okay and then we have basically the reverse here okay so in this um, um, in at this point we basically have our uh, vestigial sideband modulated um, um, signal and then of course after we do the down conversion from RF we are at baseband again okay um, yeah if you go into the papers uh, I am citing in the you know at the end of this uh, slide set or even better if you go to my website you will see the papers and then you know you can you can go into all the details So now, given these basics, uh, this is like about filter bank, okay? But we are not uh, talking about filter bank here. We're talking about combination of massive MIMO and filter bank. So now both are suitable to serve a large number of users. Why? Um, well, massive MIMO we saw implicitly uh, allows to co-schedule users in the same area, right? Because it's very precise in transmitting to the users creating these pencil beams basically and then you can have many users close by um, and filter bank likewise because it does relax the um, synchronization requirements right so a big problem when you have a very tight synchronization requirement like you know FDM is that you have to synchronize all of these users right but because you relax this with filter bank you can squeeze more users in the same area um, Okay. So how do they get along? Um, well, we'll see. Um, now, a bit of system model. So we have the received signal, okay, at uh, um, at the base station transmitted from the health user. Okay, so you do have uh, a real part and imaginary part. So basically, this uh, real part is uh, what we, we should retain, and that's why we have the real uh, part, right, of a block here. So we just keep uh, retain the real part. Um, so some notes. If I'm not wrong, just you know, to give you some better clue uh, about this guy, yeah, to give you some hints at least. Okay, so. Um, what you have is that this is the this HL is the channel gain vector containing the uh, channel gains between the health mobile terminal and all the capital N antennas at the base station. And remember that in a massive MIMO context, we are talking about many antennas, possibly hundreds, right? So it's a very a very tall vector okay um, uh, Q of L I mean S of L is the symbol you really transmit hmm? can be uh, 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 like QPSK symbol whatever right and then uh, the Q of L is actually how you model the contribution of inter symbol interference and intercarrier interference that's what we don't want so we just want to retain the the real part hmm? so eventually you can rewrite things in terms of um, you know uh, mat vectors and matrices so you see what I was saying yesterday about linear algebra you can see it here it's a very compact way to write things okay and then you can zoom in and see you know you can basically have all the details you want but at the first uh, say at the high uh, level of abstraction everything is written in a very compact form which is very handy because the systems we are dealing with are not so simple right so you do need to have a 
kind of you know tidy and compact way to write things to understand the system better so this is true regardless of the work you do in signal processing so for those of you that have uh, an interest in phi and signal processing and you don't feel you're that proficient with linear algebra I think it's time high time actually no matter the stage of your PhD or research that you you know go back to study better linear algebra okay matrix theory and apparently with massive MIMO it's also important to know more about ma uh, random matrix theory so definitely any good fundamental book on uh, you know uh, linear algebra would be very useful to your research okay so uh, you can do different receivers as usual I mean we can do match filter we can do MMSC MMSC you have a standard way to optimize this problem you're basically minimizing the mean square error so you're minimizing the the error between what was actually sent and what your guess is, right? So this is standard uh, DSP. Um, yeah, I'm not going into the details because I want to, you know, for the sake of time, but again, in the paper, you will have all the details so you can write things, um, you know, uh, um, maybe I can just give you some hint. Uh, just not to leave you, you know, in the dark. So you see the the expression you have for the received match filter signal has a few components. Okay, so this A matrix, it's basically um, you rewrite somehow the combination of the H matrix, basically uh, uh, the the channel matrix re rewritten. Okay. Uh, and then you have gamma. Gamma is just uh, some combination of rows of uh, an identity matrix, so nothing special. And D would be a diagonal where you have the links of some combination of some basically combination of the channel matrix, because that's what you do with mass filter. Okay, you basically divide by the gain of um, by the power actually of, of a certain channel gain, right? That's what you do with match filter. So eventually, since you have a signal um, model, you can rewrite things uh, in function of what you want and add anything else. So anything else is basically the um, ICI and ISI and the noise, right? So at this stage, you can actually um, right um, as NSI and R right when you have a signal model where you clearly identify the useful part of the signal and the unuseful useless part of the signal then you can write NSI and R so it's not too difficult you know you just take the power of the different vectors so you can easily might be a good exercise actually to derive this from the um, received signal expression no big deal anyway um, and likewise you can write actually the MMSC received um, signal. So I'm not going in, into details, but it's it's there in the in the papers, okay? And again, you can write the SINR. Okay, they look different, of course. They are different receivers. So now, more interestingly, is what what is the the result uh, in terms of um, SINR over the different subcarriers? Okay. So one thing actually we want to emphasize, we call it self-equalization, is basically a reproposition of uh, the, um, what was called channel hardening, if I'm not wrong, in, um, in 4G systems where you did adopt special diversity, right, like Alamuti. So basically the, one of the principles of diversity, any diversity, doesn't need to be in space, can be time or frequency, is that you average out phase, right? It's like I'm, I'm sending multiple copies of a signal and then if one of the channels through which I'm sending one of the copies is badly affected by fading, probabilistically the others will be better. It's very unlikely, especially if the channels are uncorrelated, right? That they will all undergo severe propagation conditions. So if they are correlated, that's another story. But one of the assumptions you have under, uh, you know, behind um, diversity is that you should have uncorrelation between the different paths you use right if that's true then 
you will likely not have the situation where all the parts will be in trouble, right, in terms of fading. So what happens is that if a certain uh, you know channel experiences a deep fade, another channel won't. Maybe it will experience a much better link. Uh, therefore, you will average out things. And this is true for two antennas. It's much more true for hundreds of antennas. So it's very unlikely that you won't have this averaging effect. So what we experience, in fact, you, you do have it, and no, no big surprise. Of course, you have to do something. It's not just about transmitting. You do have to do, in this case, some, uh, we are considering the uplink case. So you do have um, to have some linear combining. Uh, what I, I showed before, it's mismatch filter or MMSC. You can do zero forcing as well. So this is the way you would process all uh, the received um, signals per subcarrier. Okay, so over each subcarrier, you do all this averaging. And then you would see, in fact, that the, the uh, response over frequency will tend to be pretty flat if you increase the number of antennas. Again, no big surprise, I would say. Okay, we already kind of knew that from lower order MIMO systems. It's just with massive MIMO, you know, much better. So w one of the main messages about massive MIMO, in my opinion, yeah, there are big advantages, but no, um, in a sense, very little big surprises. So anything that worked for MIMO will work even better for massive MIMO. There are complications in design, hardware and so on, but in, in terms of the fundamental theory, um, I think I, I can say there is no major um, revolution, okay? We, it's still what we used to know, <coughs> But just you know, it it take is taking it to the extreme. So in this case, yes, we knew the spatial diversity can average out fades with massive MIMO even more so. Okay, so as simple as that. Um, now, I one thing you might wonder is what's what's the role of filter bank? Because this, what I'm saying, implies that you do the processing per subcarrier. You can likewise do the same for OFDM. Right? And in fact, the first application of massive MIMO to multi care was in, in an OFDM context, as I said before. There are, though, so th the main um, theory is the same, okay? But there are some specific advantages in, in terms of filter bank um, which make it prefer to OFDM when combining with massive MIMO, at least in some contexts, okay, where these advantages are important. So, for example, because of reduced out of band emission you can get with filter bank, you can have a more flexible carrier aggregation. All right? You can be more contained in frequency, which means you can have tinier blocks right? of, of spectrum you can aggregate. Um, another thing is that you have a lower sensitivity to carrier frequency offset, again, for the same reason. Um, right? And um, one thing also we can say is that uh, basically because of the, uh, this uh, self-equalization property we discussed before, this uh, channel hardening over frequency, you don't need so many subcarriers, right? Because even if you have many subcarriers, you would still, you see, uh, in a sense you pay a bit of a price because because of this averaging, you lose also frequency diversity. So to have many won't play such a big role because eventually the things have a result. Now, it might be a bit bad if you had to do, um, uh, let's say, scheduling in frequency, but that has to do with the old way to do um, resource allocation. With massive MIMO, we saw that it doesn't matter too much because eventually we can just put all the users in the same frequency band. They can all use it all, right? And they won't interfere because we are very precise in transmitting to them. So this, in a sense, this loss of the frequency diversity property doesn't impact too much. We benefit anyway in other aspects with massive MIMO. So even if we have less subcarriers, in, in principle, it's not too bad. And there are some good points in having few subcarriers. Okay, what are they? Well, if you have fewer subcarriers, you have fewer, uh, in a sense, points of contact between subcarriers, right? You have fewer um, points in the frequency domain where things could go wrong, right? 
So if you, are, if you have subcarriers that are misaligned, you have carrier frequency offset. And we saw solutions before in this course to solve them in an OFDM context, right? But if you have fewer subcarriers, well, you will have fewer occasions to experience carrier frequency offset, right? As simple as that. Um, we already discussed also with Professor Das the problem of peak to average power ratio, which goes, uh, becomes bad when you have a lot of subcarriers, right? Because they tend to sum constructively if they are aligned, and that leads to high peaks, yeah? Um, if you have fewer subcarriers, uh, uh, smaller PAPR, again, as simple as that, right? Um, and it does have higher bandwidth efficiency because we, we saw actually yesterday when uh, talking about GFDM that it has only one CP for a certain sequence of um, uh, time symbols. Instead, OFDM would have one cyclic prefix per time symbol. I, FBMC is even better than GFDM because it has no CP at all. Uh, it has other problems, okay, it has a ramp up, a ramp down time, so, the time, so there is some delay, but in terms of bandwidth efficiency, as far as I know, it's as good as it gets, okay? So all of these advantages, uh, you know, are, are present. Um, now, in fairness, two would be there even if you had um, uh, OFDM, okay? This is true also for OFDM, just uh, in a sense, these is even better in uh, FBMC because you have also low out of band emission, okay? So you do have actually fewer subcarriers, which is good for CFO, and you also have um, low out of band. So in, in a sense, it, it kind of adds up, um, they, they add up the advantages, okay? And again, because you are, uh, you are, you are very contained in your spectrum, you don't waste power outside of the band of interest, right? So again, yes, this is true also in OFDM, but in OFBMC even better, because on top of this, you also have uh, power efficiency. So you see, it is true, two of these, I mean, this is typical, the, the first and the fourth are not exactly there with OFDM, second and third would be there with OFDM, but with FBMC, it's even better, okay? So there is a distinctive set of advantages to go for filter bank when combine it with, um, with massive vinyl. I'm not saying you, you cannot do OFDM, you can, and in fact there are works, okay, and it will have a role, for example, for possibly the next, um, you know, the next uh, wave of uh, mobile broadband services. I think it might still rely on OFDM, possibly a filter version of OFDM, but definitely for scenarios like, you know, uh, densely populated uh, environments or, you know, shopping malls, machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication, I think there is a role uh, and the potential for filter bank to be applied with massive MIMO. Okay, just some results to make it a bit more concrete. So we did study single and multi-user case. In the single user case, we got rid of the noise just to see the impact of interference, okay? So we do, we do compare uh, different uh, antennas uh, situations. So here is one antenna, 32 up to 128. And we have 32 subcarriers in this case, 64 subcarriers in this case. Uh, we just show what happens in terms of SIR over a certain frequency, normalized. So it simply means we go from a certain uh, range to a certain range, okay? And so it doesn't matter really. Uh, what the frequencies are, it's more important to see the behavior in terms of the subcarrier uh, number. So, of course, what happens is when you increase the number of antennas, you do see this self equalization effect. It's visual, right? So, the things get much smoother. Um, if you do have more subcarriers, it would be a bit less um, obvious, right? Uh, this, this effect. Um, anyway, so the main message here is that you have uh, a, a channel averaging, right? Due over frequency due to the massive MIMO situation. Correct. Yes, yes, um, yeah, th that's true. You know, I think um, it does become similar. Um, 
in fact, in my experience, uh, now it depends very much on the channel model also you use. I think we used SUI, Stanford model here. That will probably impact a bit, but um, in my experience, uh, there is there are diminishing returns with massive MIMO. So, and sometimes it's pretty soon in terms of the of the antennas, right? It will depend, I suppose, on the channel. But I think you have a good point in the sense that depending on what you want to achieve, um, the the number of antennas might not be that high eventually. Uh, one thing that though always helps is the array gain. So that goes with the logarithm of the number of antennas. So the higher the better. Again, though a logarithm is a very compressed function, right? So there are regions where it's basically linear, regions where it's basically uh, almost uh, horizontal line. So depending on what it's like with power amplifier, right, saturation, depending on where you are in the region, then it, it will make sense or not. I think if you are in a region where the, the gains are really diminishing, uh, returns kind of gains, then you should not go for that possibly because it will become very expensive and you know and might not be worth the price. I think so, yes. Okay, I'll tell you what we did. So this is UI4. Okay, um, we tested it, I think, in the, uh, let, me call, let me recollect, I think, no, that was for another work, actually, we, di we did use cost model also, but for another work, I, I, I don't know, honestly, I, I would imagine, possibly, uh, if you have a much higher level of multipath, that should impact, so I would say that you should see bigger differences between high number of antennas and smaller if you have a much richer multipath. I don't remember the number of taps here, uh, but you know, the more, the, the, the more number of taps you have, the better gain you should get from higher number of antennas. Yeah, that, that should be there. Okay, another question? Um, this is just to compare MF and MMSC. So this is something we already discussed. So MF basically does invert the channel matrix in an approximate way, right? It doesn't use the inverse, it uses the Hermitian. So you do have H Hermitian H basically, and that's not the best thing you can do. It should be H to the minus one H or a pseudo inverse, right? So MMSC does this pseudo inverse business plus it takes care of the noise enhancement problem and definitely it's, uh, it's no, sorry, I'm saying something wrong. That's true for the multi-user case. In the single user case, you don't see that. You see they do the same. Um, they, they behave the same, but of course here you see the impact of having more uh, antennas. So this is the gain I was talking about before, right? The um, SINR gain, which is 10 log 10 of the number of antennas. So uh, when you have, say, four times more antennas, you will see, um, Okay, let me see if it uh, 10, log 10. Uh, so this would be four times. So log 10 of four, how much is that? Uh, don't recollect now, times 10. Anyway, you should get more or less, if you do the math, about 5 dB gain. Now what I was saying before, it is true for the multi-user case. So in the multi-user case, you start to have actually um, interference potentially from other users, okay, and this is um, something where match filter has problems to cope with, right, because it does not invert uh, the channel matrix uh, properly, so of course if you have only one user, this problem wouldn't be there, right? Does this model cater for the scattering? Which yes, there is some, there is some, it, it's, uh, it's one of the standard models to simulate a wireless channel. So it does have some, I don't remember the details, but if you check, you know, it's, it's a model developed by Stanford in the year 2000, so I think. So it does, it does have a few, I think it's six, right, Sandeep? Yeah. So it's called a Stanford University Interim, right? I don't know why Interim, maybe if they, they completed it at some point, but it, there are a few others. So a good one is um, a cost model cost 207 if I'm not wrong, it's another good one, yeah. Uh, there are some models from Winner project in Europe. Um, you know, 
these are fairly standard normally. So you, you do have, if you just you know, check uh, online, you will find like what people normally use, okay? Um, it's normally not, I mean, we are not doing research on channel models, so we just rely on what are the main ones, but uh, I'm doing some other work which I don't present in this course, uh, where actually one thing about these models is that uh, most of them invariantly are statistical. So what we try to do in the other work uh, I'm doing um, is to have a deterministic channel model. So we do derive the thing from Maxwell equations. For that though, you need to know the, the geometry of the environment. So if you know where the buildings are, where the users are, um, okay, then you can come up with uh, more precise modeling of the channel, which leads actually to less ideal results than with the probabilistic models. But for that, you need to know the geometry. If you don't know the geometry, then the best you can do, I suppose, is uh, statistical. There is also an approach called ray tracing. Again, I didn't work on that, so I don't comment too much. I know it's fairly complicated to adopt, though. It requires some, uh, you know, um, some some work. Uh, in the main, most of the people adopt some statistical models um, of different nature. Um, and you would have a different power delay profile, so you would have number of taps, you would have the power basically on each of the of the taps over time, and that will, will lead to different models for the uh, scattering, right? You do have also extensions of this model to consider actual scatterers, so they are still probabilistic, but you, you start to add some deterministic position of, of the scatterers, so that, you know, there's many different things you can do actually. Uh, depending on the level of realism you want to give to your um, work. So um, basically the message here is that since you have multi-user interference, match filter will at some point suffer because it does not invert properly the channel matrix. MMSA does a better job. It's practically a pseudo-inverse, also taking care of noise enhancement. Therefore, you would have a much better situation. Another thing uh, to notice is that um, in both cases, okay, uh, no, actually just in this guy. So in this case, the, um, uh, say the channel averaging effect depends only on the number of antennas, but it is the same for match filter and MMSC, while in this case, only MMSC provides this channel averaging. So match filter is also suffering in terms of this it's not probably a very good idea to do match filter unless you're really constrained in terms of uh, complexity I suppose that's probably the only reason why I would go for that mm? otherwise MMSC or ZF are better choices um, we are limiting our, our uh, attention to linear schemes you can do also other things non-linear you can do uh, so some sort of interference cancellation right, as I see, as you did for normal MIMO, I think you can do it with massive MIMO. The thing though is that the, the gains are so good with uh, massive array that normally people don't go beyond linear schemes. There's probably not the need for that, okay? Unless you start to go into very high data rate schemes like multiplex and then you might need something about that, but I didn't work on that, so I cannot comment. Um, the best thing you can do is that dirty paper coding, theoretically, but it's very complex and it's a non-linear scheme, in fact. Mm. If you want to keep the complexity within a reasonable uh, amount and have good performance, most of the people suggest in downlink um, uh, zero forcing, generalized zero forcing, okay? And uh, in my experience, MMSC works pretty fine in uplink. So anyway, linear schemes are good enough. Okay, so this uh, completes the um, module two. Any question? Yes, Sashan, please. So yes. Yes. Yes, I mean, of course, in, if you increase the band, then you have, uh, but you know, the, the, the thing is, uh, I mean, to, to my understanding, if you have a flat channel, it shouldn't be the case, right? Because you do have one gain. So it's still. Uh, 
Well, yeah, okay, the channel has the clearance mandated test, but the effect is that with the post-processing, it doesn't appear. See my point? So if you have a result things and they appear as flat, does it really matter? Why do you care about clearance band in that case, right? Yes. No, 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 yeah, yeah. So sorry if I'm not too clear. Uh, this is like, uh, this is implicitly assuming, yeah, this, I'm, I'm talking massive MIMO, yeah. yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah, sorry if I wasn't clear. Um, there are some advantages, uh, like for example, more flexible carrier aggregation and high bandwidth efficiency. I think this is true, no matter what, right? Uh, but the other two are a consequence of, so you reduce the number of subcarriers when you combine with massive MIMO, not in general. Yes, that's, that's a good ob observation. Any other comment? Okay. Yes. 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 Um, yes, but you, you you see in CMT you you also uh, right. So you you write for SMT. I think CMT they take care of that by uh, Dublin, right? The you see. You basically reduce by half, right? the subcarrier spacing in this case. But in general, you're right. So people are aware of that. So there is, uh, there is some work going on. There are some schemes that they acknowledge that, OK, we, we reduce it by half. Some schemes that you know, uh, they do something. In general, I think there are schemes that can achieve the same spectral efficiency as OFDM in that sense, in the literature, OK? And there is there's more than one, probably. I think they are. They can derive CMT from SMT. Yes. D correct. That's true. Yes. So we pick CMT because some of the authors did work before with CMT, and they were more familiar with that. Probably, you know, it's also personal taste, I suppose. Um, but in, in they are equivalent. Yes. So you can you can do the tractation in terms of one or the other. So that that doesn't change anything. Yes. 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 More or less, yeah. Look, it is. I think. I think it should be actually. If I'm not wrong, it should be six, because you multiply by four. So every time you multiply by 2, you get a plus 3 dB. So if you really want the exact number, it should be 6, I think, right? Correct? So it's like any time you double things, you get plus 3 dB. So plus 3 plus 3 is plus 6, yeah. Yeah, so what was your question, actually? Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing that I was, uh, is it just, I mean, is it the, it's just gain arrogant? It's same when uh, we go from n equals to 10 to n Yeah, I mean, in uh, you will get a logarithmic gain, but then when you see it in dB, you keep adding, every time you double, you will keep adding 3 dB, I guess, right? Uh, there are other problems that uh, will kick in. I think if you start to increase too, ma too much the number of antennas, you will have hardware considerations, right, and other things, but ideally, it shouldn't matter, right? Every time you, you double, you will have plus 3 dB, and that's always true. So if you have 10 log 10 of a number, so that, that should be ever increasing. But uh, we know that there are other issues, right? There are issues to do with, um, with, with hardware and with, uh, I suppose, um, yeah, if you have distributed schemes, it's a lot of information to, to exchange. Uh, you just stick to the collocated one, I think mostly the problem is the, um, I would say is the hardware, yeah. 
Another thing is like, you know, there has to be a trade-off between how precise you get with your beams and how you track the users. So you see, if you start to increase too much the number of antennas, you become possibly uh, infinitely, infinitely precise. But that requires an in infinitely precise tracking system. You see my point? Otherwise, you keep losing the user. So uh, be you better, uh, better be careful what you wish for in that sense. Right? So there has to be, theory tells us that, you know, great, increase the number of antennas as much as you can. But the practice of telecom tells us also that you have to go hand in hand with the design, right? So there are many challenges still unsolved uh, in the relation between tracking and mobility, for example. And uh, so, yeah, good uh, to increase the number of antennas. You get array gain, you get um, energy efficiency, you get, you know, simplified RRM. But for example, you get pilot contamination to solve, you get hardware problems, you get, uh, you know, tracking problems. So it's not a freelance. Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of deployments. I think it's still early. Uh, I think there are prototypes, definitely. There is one from Rice University. There is one in Sweden. The numbers are in slightly above 100, I think. Maybe 121, stuff like that. So I think there are studies, definitely. You know, when you have theoretical studies, people consider 500. I mean, I mean uh, we have papers ourselves, 10,000, you know, then, then it's not a big deal. But when you have a prototype, that's another story, and I think yeah, as far as I'm aware, we're probably in the order of 100 to 150 at the moment. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Right, uh, I, I'm not familiar with the, uh, you know, all the details of the work. I think they are fairly realistic. Now, one thing they also claim in some study from the Swedish group, they say that Massimo should help with reduction of RF impairments. So again, it shouldn't matter so much, okay, how realistic you are. But again, this, I think it's a more theoretical study, simulation based. Um, um, I think they do they do s um, different uh, I think um, um, linear um, receivers I guess um, I'm not too aware if they consider these multi-cell problems like pilot contamination I cannot comment on that I guess something might be happening because honestly people have been working on massive minor prototypes for the last few years. So I would be surprised if nobody's doing that. But it does step up in the compl complexity of what you're testing, right? Because you need, at this point, you will need a multiple cell. Uh, so it might be a bit complicated. Another thing I noticed is that they, I mean, some prototypes are real, Massimo. Some prototypes, they basically have one antenna and they move it, right? And then they take offline processes. It's like, a, in a sense, virtual massive MIMO system, if you want. But, you know, there are many things happening, so I, I suppose something is going on in on that side, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know the details, so I can't comment on that. How much better we are right. Um, I I think I don't have the results with me right now. If you contact me offline, I I could find out. I think we do have some. At least we can point to some works. I think there are. Uh, there are also works on uh, sensitivity analysis, okay, where the, we show comparison between many different waveforms. Okay, not myself, but another person in my group has done work on that. So there are a few things I didn't show here. Um, now, uh, I don't have a figure right now, but what I remember, I saw a plot about this out of band, and 
GFDM probably gets better than OFDM by uh, 10, 15 dB. I don't know, Sashank, if you remember, not much more though, yeah. right? And they do something like this symbol cancellations. I'm not even too sure about yeah, that. Right, uh, and they still with the symbol cancellation. Right. Right, but that's kind of biased because they do the symbol. So maybe it's similar. Yeah, right, filter band goes very low. So I, I think we are talking maybe minus 60, minus 70 dB. So it's uh, better actually than uh, than than OFDM. I think I, I I don't want to say number because I might be wrong, but definitely few orders of magnitude. Uh, uh, not few orders of magnitude, but you know, a few tens of dB better than both, than OFDM, and so it's it's pretty sharp actually, and uh, it's, it's it's very very contained. Okay, so you have very low spectral regrowth. So um, yeah, I I don't want to say a number because I don't remember, but we are talking a, a sizable amount, like a few tens of dB is better actually. Yes. So yeah, I think you can find these results. If you don't find them, you can let me know, and then I'll, I can dig it out for you. Yeah, I do remember a plot definitely. Any other question? Let me just check where we are with time. Um, I don't feel like starting the new topic because it would be a murder to start it uh, right now. Right? Um, there's still time for a couple of questions if you want. If not, I set you free. Yes. Any? Heard somebody asking something? No? So you mentioned it off uh, when we had started the introduction. Uh, there's some problem with SDMC and method management.